Good evening. I'm Matt Jacobs, director of the Bob Graham Center for Public Service, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the Okora at Pew Hall. Here at the Graham Center, we are committed to helping students develop the mindset and skills necessary for effective civic engagement, public leadership, public policy development and implementation, and public service. Few individuals embraced and displayed those principles more so than Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It is therefore a real pleasure to partner with the African American Studies Program and the Center for Inclusion and Multicultural Engagement on a program reflecting on his life and legacy and pushing us to consider the extent to which we are, or perhaps are not, achieving what they demand. I'll also note that I'm delighted tonight to actually finally meet Dr. David Canton, who came to UF in August of 2020 as the new director of the African American Studies Program with a charge of building that into a full-fledged department. We've been on dozens of Zooms together in the last 18 months, but today's actually the first time we've met face to face. So it's a pleasure to have you here, David, and, and welcome. Uh, as always, I want to thank the outstanding team here at the center for their hard work and collaborative spirit in putting tonight's event together, working closely with, with both of our partners. Marianne Vernetson, Dorothy Zimmerman, Leah Honecker, and Anna Cavalcante have all been critical to the success of tonight's event. Finally, we have audience here in Pew Hall, obviously, but we also have an audience remote wherever you may be. Welcome. We're delighted to have you. Uh, after our guest concludes his, re his presentation, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions, whether you're here in person or attending remotely. For those of you who are remote, you will submit your question via the comment bubble at the bottom right of your screen, and we'll be sure to read those questions here uh, over the mic and such for, for us to get a response to them. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Natalie Turen, Associate Director of the Center for Inclusion and Multicultural Engagement at the University of Florida. Natalie is a double gator, uh, having received both her Bachelor's of Science and her Master's of Science degree in Health Education from the University of Florida. While at UF, she has worked with faculty members and campus partners to support returning Gators and UF Promise students living on campus. Prior to returning to the University of Florida in 2017, Natalie worked at some other school in the SEC, also known as South Carolina, where she created and implemented curriculum that fostered student development and academic success. Welcome, Natalie, and thank you for partnering with us. First and foremost, I did not know that my intro was going to be that deep, so thank you. Um, I don't talk about that school because we're in Gator Nation. Um, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you again for joining us. My name is Natalie Turin, and I serve as the Associate Director for the Center of Inclusion and Multicultural Engagement, uh, formerly known as Multicultural and Diversity Affairs, or MCDA. Um, and while a lot of people may think that that name is quite long, right, the Center for Inclusion and Multicultural Engagement, I actually love it, and I love it for two reasons. While I don't consider myself to be a competitive person, um, I do always challenge myself to say it correctly every single time, and I'm going to challenge you all to do the same. Um, and then two, I love it because I really feel as though it encompasses our, our work for students, what we hope to accomplish, which is to create a space where all students feel as though they are included and they have an opportunity to engage with our office, whether that's collaboratively with different units, with different teams, or whether that's with our own staff who represents what they look like or their shared lived experiences. You know, we are hoping to create a space where students can transform, where they can um, have transformative experiences um, and engage in meaningful dialogue. And so as an office within the center, we strive to coordinate educational, cultural, and social programs that focus on the black experience at the University of Florida within the United States and, of course, across the African diaspora. And so it's truly an honor to collaborate with the Bob Graham Center for Public Service as well as African American Studies Department um, so that we can have this meaningful dialogue about Dr. King and his legacy um, as a black woman. Um, I could not imagine being a part of a protest, as some might call it, an insurrection, as others might call it, um, and being able to walk away, right? And so when you think about um, 
being a minority in this country and being told a message that you should engage in peaceful protest and then you see others um, who are not black, who are not minorities um, at our capital, you know, engaging in behaviors that caused a lot of destruction, a lot of harm, um, that inspired a lot of fear. It just makes me wonder, right? It, it makes me wonder what would that have looked like um, for me or for someone like myself um, who was brought up to follow a lot of Dr. King's principles. So I digress. Um, as I mentioned, it's truly an honor to, to collaborate. And so I'm, I'm looking forward for us to have this in a, this this conversation about Dr. King's vision for nonviolence and how there's a, a gross misalignment with what happened on uh, January 6th. Um, and so just knowing that our, our purpose here is to create opportunities for dialogue, for us to reflect, and ultimately for us to move into action. And so I truly look forward to participating in this conversation about what needs to be done to get us to a more equitable society, if that's possible. Um, and without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Canton up to give his opening remarks. Thank you, Natalie. Um, good evening, I'm Dr. David Canton, the director of the African American Studies Program at the University of Florida. As Natalie said, I, I started with last August. This is probably our first hybrid live event bringing in speakers, so it's good to be out in person, not behind the camera. But for those who are live streaming, hello to you too. Uh, I got my BA in history from Morehouse College, my master's in African American Studies from The Ohio State University, my PhD in history at Temple University. So for those of you that grew up in the Black Baptist Church, you know, they have what they have, the uh, pre-Semonic song. So I'm kind of doing a pre-Semonic, uh, uh, some words to set it up for Dr. McKinney that's, that really works with the theme for tonight and Dr. King. On Monday, January 20th, 1986, this nation celebrated the first Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. On Mon this coming up Monday in many cities across the country, there'll be marches, a day on, not a day off, and many participating in other civic events. However, what gets lost is Dr. King's ideas and his fight for equity. When I think of King, I think of voting rights. For example, in 1971, six years after Congress passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, there were 13 African-American congresspersons. In 2022, there are 58. It's 56 in the House and two in the Senate and there's a third black senator from South Carolina. There's been 11 black senators in this nation's history. Two were elected during Reconstruction and nine since 1966, one year after the Voting Rights Act of 1965. In 2008, the nation elected the first black president of Barack Obama, and in 2020, the nation elected the first black women, Asian descent vice president, 57 years after the Voting Rights Act. So since voting does not work, in 2013, the United States Supreme Court passed the Shelby v. Holder, where we start the decline of voting with voter suppression. And in 2022, we are fighting to protect, protect voting rights again. And this is taking place during King's holiday. This is Groundhog Day in the worst way, fighting for voting rights again. Or as the great philosopher Yogi Berra once said, it's deja vu all over again. But as Dr. King said, we still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. Co this may be mankind's last chance to choose between chaos or community. Charles McKinney Jr. is the Neville Fearson Bryan Chair of Africana Studies and an Associate Professor of History at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. His areas of expertise are the civil rights black power era, African-American activism, and African-American politics. He received a bachelor's degree in history from Morehouse College and completed his doctoral studies at Duke University. His first book was titled Greater Freedom, The Evolution of the Civil Rights Struggle in Wilson, North Carolina. His second project co-edited with Aram Guduzian, my name's getting me, Guduzian, it, is An Unseen Light, Black Struggles for Freedom in Memphis, Tennessee. 
He was currently working on two book projects, the first tentatively titled George Lee's World, Race, Power, and The Afterlife of Segregation. The second book co-edited with Francois Hamlin titled Rights and Lives, an exploration of the civil rights and Black Lives Matter movements is under contract at Vanderbilt University Press. His writing has appeared in newspapers and information in venues across the country, including the Memphis Commercial Appeal, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, Black Perspectives, Vanity Fair, and MLK 50, Justice Through Journalism. He has provided commentary on radio programs across the country, news outlets in the United Kingdom, Europe, China, New Zealand, Australia, and has appeared on CNN. So let's give a hand for Dr. McKinney. Good evening. No, no, no. Good evening. As you know how you know how we roll. It is so very good to be here. Uh, I guess Gator Nation, right? It's good to be here in Gator Nation. Um, my parents live in Fort Myers, and so uh, this is flyover country for me when I go visit my visit my visit my parents. My dad just retired from Florida Gulf Coast University. Um, uh, at any rate. Uh, I am very, very happy to be here. Uh, Brother Canton, thank you for that warm introduction. Um, I, I, I want to hear y'all talk. <laughs> you guys were getting ready to, uh, getting ready to go in. I really, I really appreciate those, uh, those warm words um, from my Morehouse brother, Brother Canton. Um, thank you for all of the uh, sponsors and co-sponsors, African American Studies and the Bob Graham Center and and all of the folks who, um, who helped to make, uh, who helped to bring me down here. I really, really appreciate it. Special shout out to Marianne Vernetson and uh, Leah Honecker and, and, other, and other folks uh, providing support, um, the, the true powers behind the thrones, as it were, um, in helping to make these sorts of things happen. Um, our administrative, uh, administrative support in, the, in, in this moment, right? Um, true heroes, right? You know, it's not just a live event, but it's also going to be streamed and classes and Zoom and, you know, and so always a special shout out to the folks who help make, make this happen. So I've got a couple of comments, um, but I'm really looking forward to um, question and answer. I'm really, really looking forward to a discussion, a conversation. I want to chop it up. I want to chop it up with you all. But I do have a few thoughts uh, about this uh, rather provocative title that I provided, that I provided you all um, for this uh, for this talk. So in the teaser trailer um, that I sent you all, I asked a question. Right in the wake of the most violent confrontation in the U.S. Capitol since the War of 1812, how could that moment pass without any substantive commentary on nonviolence? Given how the insurrection occurred just days before Martin Luther King, uh, the Martin Luther King federal holiday, how does it work out that none of the talking heads on any of the stations that I was listening to. I even went over to the places where I don't listen, generally, right? Didn't hear a word about Martin King. Didn't hear a word about nonviolence. This happened on January 6th. Martin King's birthday is January 15th. His birthday is nine days later, right? So the same talking heads who were talking about the insurrection at the Capitol are going to pivot nine days later to talk about the disciple of nonviolence. We're going to pivot nine days later and talk about nonviolence. Where were, where were you? What happened? Right? And so I've been intrigued by this for, uh, for literally a year. Right? Um, you know, there were no, you know, they didn't, they didn't mention, they didn't invoke nonviolence themselves. Uh, they didn't bring in any historians, civil rights historians like me. <laughs> right? Uh, like the mighty, mighty Paul Ortiz, uh, my, my friend and comrade from graduate school. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Um, you know, he didn't get called either, right? Dave Canton didn't get called. None of the historians who study civil rights, none of the historians who study King, nobody got called. No, so not only did they not talk about it, they didn't have anybody else come in and talk about it either. I'm absolutely fascinated by this. I did an interview with an official in the Catholic Church. He's a Monsignor in uh, New York City, 
on January 15th, on King's birthday, nine days again, nine days after the insurrection. And when I mentioned King and nonviolence in the context of, 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 of the insurrection, because that's what we were there for, to talk about the insurrection, he stopped and he said, wow, I, you know, that never occurred to me. That never occurred to me. On King's birthday, it didn't occur to him, this Monsignor in the Catholic Church, that maybe those two things should be in community with each other. How is this separation so thorough, so complete, that people who traffic in the philosophy of nonviolence are shook when I bring King up in the context of the events in the Capitol? I mean, for a bunch of folks, it's like dividing by zero. Like, what, what do you, why are you bringing up King? Why are you bringing up King now? What's, 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 King got to, what's King got to do with this? The other thing that I noticed, and I've noticed this for a number of years, right, is that a numerous uh, liberal theologians who've dedicated themselves to racial reconciliation and healing the ancient racial divisions in our nation. When I, when I engage them about the work of Martin King, and I do a lot of racial reconciliation work, or at least I used to back when I thought it was functional. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would ask, so, you know, you're, you're doing this work, Reverend so-and-so, you know, Reverend so-and-so, Reverend so-and-so. Let me ask you, so, you know, so how do you engage King in your work about racial reconciliation, in your work on racism, in your work on helping people think, and think, think through and think about white supremacy, right, and the legacies of slavery and the reg legacies of racial subordination? So what, what are you using? Are you using Stride Toward Freedom, right, the chronicle of 50,000 Negroes who took, uh, took the heart and principle of nonviolence to the streets in, in Montgomery? Are you, are, you, are you communing with, are you thinking through Strength to Love, which is another brilliant book of kings, or Why We Can't Wait? What are you accessing when you, when you think through and think about King? And nine times out of 10 over the course of the last few years, they say, you know, I hadn't really, hadn't really read any Martin. Hadn't really read any Martin King. Hadn't really interacted with any of, his, any of his work, to which I gently ask them, my Christian brothers, my Christian sisters, how exactly are you doing this work? This work of racial reconciliation when you literally have figured out how to skip over, if not the central voice, one of the most central voices in racial reconciliation work produced in the United States. It produced in all of United States history. How do you not engage that work? How does that fly? So what I'd like to suggest in this moment, right, and the way this moment is disconnected from King, right, the concept of nonviolence or any of, I, or any of his ideas, what I want to suggest is that this moment and these, 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 these interactions represent the violent culmination of a decades-long project to bury, obscure, and re-kill Martin Luther King Jr. It's taken a long, coordinated series of events to get us to this point, and what I'd like to do is take us back a bit um, and lead us up to January 6th, right? This is, a, a, this is a conspiracy. This murder, this second murder, is also a conspiracy. It's a whole bunch of people involved, a whole bunch of contexts, a whole bunch of whole bunch of factors, whole bunch of ingredients. And so let's, let's unpack a few of them, right? First set of suspects, historians, me, right? Um, folks, in my, folks in my neck of the woods who have um, become quite complicit in this nefarious reframing of both King and the black freedom struggle at large, right? King is a symbol, King symbolizes Right, the ways in which we've obscured larger, broader histories, right? Histories of black struggle, histories of black freedom, right? The black radical tradition, the black Christian, the black religious tradition, right? All of these traditions have been obscured, have been, have been summarily sort of abstracted out of many of our, many of our, many of our realities. Not all of our realities, but many of them, right? So historians, we're on the hook for, for some of this. We are complicit in trapping King and Amber on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963. We've played a role in encasing that moment and confining it to the past and confining King to the past and by, by extension confining the movement and what that movement was about to the past, something that we study in history books. 
We've played a role in this. We've played a role in creating something called a master narrative of the civil rights movement. I'm going to read this narrative to you really quickly. You will recognize it because it's the way we've all been taught. Right? I look at all these students here. Right? You know, I was at Morehouse in, uh, in 1986, the first, King, the first King holiday. And I have to remind myself on a regular basis, my none of my students have ever known a time before a King holiday. Right? You have always had a King holiday. We've got two kids at home. And so for years, they would come home with these really terrible drawings of Martin King. Right? Oh, honey, that's beautiful. We'll put it on the refrigerator. God, that's terrible. Right? So you've never not known a moment where we studied Martin King. Here is the narrative that you have been beholden to. Here is the narrative that, again, historians have, have, have helped create for you. Traditionally, relationships between the races in the South were oppressive. In 1954, the Supreme Court decided this was wrong. Inspired by the court, courageous Americans, black and white, took protest to the street in the form of sit-ins, bus boycotts, and freedom rides. The protest movement, led by the brilliant and eloquent Dr. Martin Luther King, aided by a sympathetic federal government, sympathetic federal government, most notably the Kennedy brothers and a born-again Lyndon Johnson, was able to make America understand racial discrimination as a moral issue. Once Americans understood that discrimination was wrong, they quickly moved, quickly moved, to remove racial prejudice and discrimination from American life, as evidenced by the Civil Rights Act of 64 and 65. Dr. King was tragically slain in 68. Fortunately, by that time, the country had been changed, changed for the better in some fundamental ways. The, mu the movement was a remarkable victory for all Americans. Cue the patriotic music, right? You know, flag in the back, right? You know, all Americans. This was written by Julian Bond, and it's a tongue-in-cheek caricature of the black freedom struggle. That's what you learned. There was a beginning of this struggle. There was a struggle, and then the struggle was over. And after the struggle was over, there was a set of legislation that had been passed, and that's pretty much all you people needed. Boom. All done. That's the framing. right? This is a framing that every elementary school in the United States emulates. Right? This is the framing that you will see uh, over the course of the next week and a half uh, from uh, corporate, corporate America, 365 black from McDonald's, right? You know, um, you, you know you, you'll see this being reinforced by, uh, by corporations. You'll see this being reinforced by politicians, right? Regardless of party, doesn't matter. Thank God for Dr. King. He came and fixed America all by himself. Stop of the beginning of a movement, the end of a movement. Who's in, who's out? This master narrative, wonderfully passive language. One of the things that we talk about in my classes is that first line of the narrative, traditionally relationships between the races were oppressive. That wonderfully passive language. We don't know why they were oppressive. We don't know who was causing the oppression. We just know it was oppressive. And then this movement came along and fixed it. Not some of it, but all of it, right? So this should sound familiar to many of you in the room. This is the narrative that has shaped our collective understanding of the civil rights movement over the past half century. The content has an air of the cinematic. In the beginning, there was a vaguely defined problem, segregation. We're not sure who or what is responsible for this condition. We only know that it exists and that it has been deemed a problem. There is a very specific point when this is confronted, May 17th, 1954. Courageous black and white Americans again took to the streets. Lyndon Johnson and a small merry band of brothers came together and fixed all the problems related to the unnamed malady that plagued black Americans for centuries. And with that, the movement ended. Game over. Michael Jackson drops Thriller. America fell in love with The Cosby Show. White kids could not get enough of rap music. And Barack Obama got elected to the presidency. Thank you, Martin. This narrative, however, is not to be taken lightly. It is, the central, it is a central foundational myth of contemporary American society, one that affirms the best version of our image, that of a nation where freedom is on the perpetual march. The myth of the civil rights completion is a natural outgrowth of a national investment in a broader American narrative, one that views American freedom as an ever forward moving inevitable march toward expanded autonomy and justice. This central narrative or myth as many of us would call it grounds nearly all of American history and is anchored by the hagiography that but buttresses our founding narrative. Our freedom narrative necessarily obscures the myriad inconvenient truths related to the ebb and flow of American democracy. 
this rendering of history has profound implications for all of us in all corners. Rather than contend with the complexities associated with what I call the simultaneous construction of freedom and unfreedom at the beginning of the nation, we have crafted a narrative that until recently took extra special pains to ignore the central role, for instance, that slavery has played in the founding of America, in the construction of America, in the very idea of America. So instead of grappling with the foundational realities, realities such as white supremacy, realities of black activism, black subordination. The founding narrative treats slavery and other systematic iterations of oppression as an unfortunate byproduct of the American experiment. Oops, sorry about that. This pattern is repeated down through the centuries. The expansion of democracy, this narrative during the Jacksonian era b blots out the trail of tears and the systematic removal of black men from voting rights outside of the South. It blots out the national reconciliation in the wake of the Civil War uh, blots out the reality of the fact that, that that reconciliation was largely predicated on both the erasure of slavery as the central cause of the war and of black men and women from the conflict. National reconciliation leads directly to Jim Crow. That's not a dotted line. That's not a curved line. That's a solid line. So these narratives come at a cost. And we are still paying the cost of these narratives. So the King holiday, it's also a part of these, part of his narrative, a part of this narrative about the perpetual, the perpetual improvement of America, right? Again, like I said, major corporations reinforcing the notion every King holiday and Black History Month right behind it, right? Paying tribute to the brave men and women who fought successfully, always successfully, to extend American democracy to black people. This powerful notion that there was a struggle for freedom that is now successfully completed is frequently used to disconnect the insurgency of the black freedom struggles of the 1960s to the contemporary challenges faced by black folk right now. If the civil rights movement was a success, how come I still can't get along? If the civil rights movement was a success, how come George Floyd died the way he died? If the civil rights movement was a success, how come a black person with a credit score of 800, that group of black people have lower acceptance rates of home loans than white folks with a score of 550. Why does that still happen? Why is that still occurring? What should we do about this? So I argue that one of the biggest victims of this master narrative, this master narrative of the civil rights movement, the master narrative of American history, one of the victims, I would contend, is Martin King. In the years after his assassination, we have succeeded in turning him into what hist historian Timothy Tyson calls an innocuous black Santa Claus, genial and vacant, a benign vessel that can be filled with whatever generic good wishes the occasion dictates. This new rendition of Brother Martin, King 2.0, is meek, turns cheeks, and has dreams. He has been claimed by conservatives who see a, a kindred spirit and by socialists who view the last years of his life through a lens, lens of redistributive justice. After his death, we moved away from a more historically accurate image of King, the black Southern preacher and fierce social critic who spent nearly all of his public life standing against some of the most powerful forces in American life. So there's no more significant component to the master narrative than the carefully curated mythology erected with regard to the life and work of Dr. Martin King. Indeed, this heavily mitigated King, the King whose words and work are rendered as a uh, careful selection of dreams and Christian forbearance and nonviolence has become the most potent um, facet of a civil rights narrative that is trapped again in a tidy past, safe from critical engagement with cultural realities. This king, again, is trapped in amber. This king, this new version of king, this king 2.0, is designed specifically not to address any of, this, uh, any of the challenges that we are facing here, or so it would seem. The silences contained within master narratives are powerfully evident all over the place, even at the Martin King Memorial statue in Washington, D.C., as the brilliant scholar Jean Theo Harris observes, of the 14 quotes etched into the edifice. There's 14 quotes around the thing. You walk around, 14 quotes. Not, this is a quote from her. Quote, not one of them uses the words racism or segregation or racial inequality. 
Not one. This is a monument to Martin Luther King. Daddy, what was he fighting against? Well, go read the quotes. Daddy, I still don't know what he was fighting against. What exactly was going on? Back to that master narrative. Relations were oppressive. They were bad, but they got better. So one of the things that we can do, and one of the things I recommend that we all do, is take King's work seriously and push back against right, this King 2.0. And one of the places we need to start to do that is King's work right, and reading that work seriously, right, taking that work for what it is, and also understanding that work in the context in which that work was written, right, in the context in which King and all of these other folks who are writing and thinking and living through this moment Right? Thinking about context. Again, I'm a historian and I'm biased, but history matters. Context matters. Right? So, I have a dream. His most, famous, his most famous speech. This is the thing that all those folks I mentioned earlier, right? You know, all the folks doing the racial reconciliation work and the, and, you know, the folks that, you know, they all, you know, content of character, right? You know, not by the color of the skin, content of character. Great, 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 fine. I need to stop talking now. So no text of King's is more used and misused than his I Have a Dream speech given on the steps of the Lincoln Monument during the March on Washington in 1963. The aspirational tone set in the second part of the sermon point the way towards the fulfillment of the dream, a time when African Americans can fully participate in the full privileges of citizenship and equality. To be sure, this is stirring oratory. However, when I use this text in my classes and when I, and when I encourage other people to, to listen to it or read it, I am drawn to the first portion of the speech because it foregrounds the soaring hope exhibited at the end of the speech in some very specific and important ways. King is clear about the fact that the nation has failed its black citizens. America wrote her Negroes, quote, a bad check. He then goes on to inform his fellow Americans that should the nation continue its business as usual in terms of denying black people their full citizenship, quote from King, there will be neither rest nor tranquility in America. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. When the nation pauses once a year to reflect on, on this iconic speech, we don't hear a whole lot of ruminations on the first part of this speech. It remains underanalyzed to this day. First part of this speech, King says, but 100 years later, referencing 1863, referencing the emancipation of, 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 of black folk from slavery, but 100 years later, the Negro was still not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro was still languished uh, in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. So we've come here today, he continues, to dramatize this shameful condition. He then laid out the patterns and practices of racial inequality that were woven into the fabric of American life. In response to the question, when will you be satisfied? King states plainly that black folk could never be satisfied while the structures of domination, white supremacy, all of this buttressed by white supremacy, were left unchecked and unaddressed. King didn't fear making the explicit connections between these structures and the inability of black people to function as people in American life, in American society. This was not a sentiment cloaked in ambiguity or contingency. King states plainly and emphatically that the nation's unwillingness to confront racism would no longer be met with equivocation and tortured silence on the part of black folk. King understood that the first step in the process of creating what he often referred to as a new world was the action of naming the obstacles that stood in the way of positive change. We would do well to follow his lead in this regard, even in our current contentious political moment. In the next paragraph, King anchors his comments with his rock-solid commitment to nonviolence, encouraging black folk to avoid drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred, but then he quickly pivots back to the systemic inequality that dogs the lives of black folk from sea to shining sea. Again, in response to the question, when will you be satisfied? He says, we can never be satisfied, for instance. 
as long as the Negro was the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. What? Martin Luther King mentioned police brutality? I didn't know that. Mrs. Applebaum in my elementary school, or Mr. Woodruff in my middle school, or Mr. So-and-so in my high school, or God forbid, Professor So-and-so in my college, never actually got around to mentioning that Martin King had some things to say about police brutality. Martin King had a whole bunch of things to say about police brutality. Because Martin King knew, right, in the 1960s, between the KKK and police departments all around the country, when it came to the killing of unarmed black people, one of those was much better at that than the other. Police departments all across the country, the Ku Klux Klan. That's why Martin King is in Los Angeles in the early part before, uh, before the March on Washington. He's in a massive rally in Los Angeles after some unarmed black people have been killed by one of the most racist, notoriously racist police departments in the country, the Los Angeles Police Department. And he tells a crowd of 30,000 people, the most important thing you can do if you want to help the people in Birmingham, the most important thing that you can do is to set Los Angeles free because you have segregation and discrimination here as well as vitally, uh, as well as uh, crippling police brutality. That's not in Alabama. That's not in Mississippi. That's not in Tennessee. That's not in Florida. Right? That's in that southern state, my home state, the southern state of California. Right? So the violence of police brutality is then juxtaposed with the violence of legal segregation, back to King's speech and I have, uh, uh, back, uh, back to um, the, the dream speech, with specific reference to violence imposed on the minds and attitudes of young black children forced to contend with state-sanctioned apartheid. Let's be clear here. What King is doing is laying out a blueprint for a sustained nationwide revolt. That's what's going on in 1963. By the end of 1963, upwards of a half million people have been arrested. Okay, and we're just getting warmed up in 1963. 1964, 1965, throughout the rest of the, throughout the, rest of the 1960s, we're going to see revolts taking place all across the country, right, which are part and parcel of larger international protests for liberty, inequality, and justice. King knows that, and he is signaling that in this and other speeches. The other thing that he talks about in that speech is that nonviolence is a choice. We have to choose nonviolence. And he's not simply talking about individuals having to choose nonviolence, like you have to choose nonviolence, and you have to choose nonviolence. He says states need to choose nonviolence. This state has been built on violence, he says. Right? And that's why, we're in, that's, that's why we're in such a state of decay now, he will go on to say in 1966, 1967, 1968. We've got some choices. We've got some hard choices to make. King says, I side with nonviolence, but it's a daily choice. It's a choice that I have to make because I live in an extremely violent nation. I saw this amazing interview with Diane Nash once, one of the titans of the civil rights movement. If you don't know Diane Nash, Google her and read everything about her. She is one of the titans of the movement. It's an interview she did with, um, for this documentary, King, King in the Wilderness. And in this documentary, um, she's re reflecting on uh, the bombing of, uh, the, of 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham in 1963. Four little girls are murdered. And again, this bomb is planted to explode on Sunday morning. Again, we don't think about this. This is all sort of background noise when we talk about and think through about the black freedom struggle, when we talk about and think through life in the 1960s. We haven't really quite grappled with how actually actively violent that life was for black people all across the country. But in Birmingham, these racial set of racial terrorists decide to blow up a church on a Sunday morning. So in the wake of that explosion, in the wake of that terrorist attack, Diane Nash and a bunch of, the, bunch of, her, um, bunch of her comrades, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, they're sitting around and they're batting around two choices. One choice is, you know what, we can find out who did the bombing. That, that's, that won't be hard. We've got, we have contacts too. So one choice we have is to find out who did the bombing and murder them. Just go end them. The other choice we have is to register black people to vote. We chose to register black people to vote, but we had to sit down and talk about it. We had to think it through. Because they're killing our babies. They're killing our babies. 
They're killing our babies. We got to think about that. Nonviolence is a choice, and we have to make this choice every day. Bringing it back to 2001, excuse me, 2001, Space Odyssey. Bringing it back to 2021, January 6th. So when we have a conversation about King in the current moment, we as a nation will almost always select King 2.0. That's our comfort zone. We, we pick, we, we, we incline towards the black Santa Claus. That version of King who was way more interested in character than social justice. The version of King who had nothing to say about the state of the Christian church. The version of King who dreamed to the exclusion of all other activities. The version of King who mysteriously is mute about militarism, poverty, and racism. The version of King apparently who wrote a letter from the Birmingham Chamber of Commerce and not from a Birmingham jail. The original Martin King the fierce social critic who stood in the gap for the poor and the dispossessed and the marginalized is incompatible with our current context for so many of us, not all of us, but for so many of us, he is incompatible, which is why he gets reduced to sound bites emanated from all manner of places and from all manner of people. We all have examples of these, right? So that fierce social critic that we say we, we revere, that we say we appreciate, the one who speaks up for the disinherited, the one who literally gave us life to move us forward, right? we've killed him. And we kill him again and again and again to rid ourselves of his powerful searing testimony, his potential ability to bear witness to who we are, to where we are, and what we'll need to do in order to achieve a modicum of racial equality and democratic inclusion. We've killed his understanding of history and the myriad forces in play in the constitution of our society and how the power, for instance, of white supremacy lies at the center of our dilemma. In 1967, he publishes his final book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. You should read it. Students, read that book. Order 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 it right now. I think it's one of the most important books written in the 20th century. It's an eloquent distillation of his thoughts, plans, and dreams for America's future. Better jobs, higher wages, decent housing, quality education, the eradication of poverty, and an end to perpetual war. He's also really clear about what he sees as the obstacles to those goals. When it comes to poverty, he says, and the tragedy is that not only the poor, the nearly poor and the once poor, but all Americans are the victims of our failure as a nation to distribute democratically the fruits of our abundance. For directly or indirectly, not one of us is untouched by the steady spread of slums, the decay of our cities, the segregation and overcrowding in our public schools, the shocking deterioration of our hospitals, the violence and chaos in our streets, the idleness able-bodied people deprived of work and the anguished demoralization of our youth. For better or worse, we are one nation and one people. We shall solve our problems together or together we shall enter a new era of social disorder and disintegration. What would Martin King say about the United States of America if he came back in 2022? In 1966, King is an advocate of something called the Freedom Budget, right? It's a massive, massive bill, a massive proposal, right? Massive stimulus package, if you will, to jumpstart the economy so that, the, so that it starts to work for, again, the marginalized people in American society. 1966, he says, the nation has learned that it must provide freedom for all if any of us is to be free. We have learned that half measures are not enough. We know that continued unfair treatment of part of our people breeds misery and waste that are both morally indefensible and a threat to who we are. As A. Philip Randolph put it, here in these United States where there can be no economic or technical excuse for it, poverty is not only a private tragedy, but in a sense, a public crime. It is above all a challenge to our morality. Think about how different the conversation is about poverty now. Now that conversation has shifted to if you're poor, it's pretty much your fault, right? And how easily it is for you to be painted as a radical, crazy, 
a zealot if you suggest what Martin Luther King said in 1966 may actually be correct. He also talked about the threats to our democracy, again, coming even closer to January 6th. The majority of white Americans consider themselves sincerely committed to justice for the Negro. They believe that American society is essentially hospitable to fair play and to steady growth toward a middle class utopia embodying racial harmony. But unfortunately, this is a fantasy of self-deception and comfortable vanity. He will go on to say in this same book, a couple of pages later, a minority of whites who genuinely want authentic equality are balanced at the other end of the pole by the unregenerate segregationists who have declared that, here's the line, democracy is not worth having if it involves equality. Democracy is not worth having if it involves equality. The segregationist goal is the total reversal of all reforms with reestablishment of naked oppression and if need be a native form of fascism. America had a master race in the antebellum South, reestablishing it with a resurgent clan and a totally disenfranchised lower class would realize the dream of too many extremists on the right. Martin King came back in 2022. Dot, dot, dot. A total reversal of all reforms or the reversal of an election. January 6th is one of the many moments of culmination we will, have, we will have with regard to the nature and state of our, to the tenuous nature and state of our democracy. For many black folk, it was an ancient and familiar brew, politics carried out by state-sanctioned white violence. This was the primary type of violence that King fought against, warned us about. Violence deployed in the maintenance of white nationalism and a blow to our tentative, very tentative multiracial democracy. King's view of history would have placed January 6th in the long violent line of other moments when our politics were carried out by mobs, not of rabble, but mobs of the best people in town. 50,000 people were killed, 50,000 black folk were killed, assassinated in Reconstruction by the best men in their towns to maintain political power. The Wilmington race riot of 1898, the best men convened and wrote what they called the White Declaration of Rights, where they claimed that under the, under the auspices of the Constitution, they were thereby from henceforth and forevermore not going to be bound by rules and regulations set by people of the Negro race. We are claiming our constitutional rights to expunge black people from the city government of Wilmington. And we will do so if, with violence if necessary, which they did. 200, 200, people, 200 people murdered. The best men, the best women. Ida Wells being driven out of Memphis in the 1890s for her advocacy of lynching. The best men putting an ad in it, put an editorial in the newspaper. They thought it was a man who, said, who wrote it. Said, whoever this person is, this person needs to be met at the train station and castrated and strung up in the middle of the city. That's not by the rabble. That's not by a bunch of hicks out in the woods coming down from the mountains. That's in the commercial appeal. That's in the newspaper of record in Memphis, Tennessee. The best men. Ask Paul Ortiz about the violence that jumps off in Florida in his brilliant book, Emancipation Betrayed. There's a lynching in 1913, I think Paul talks about it, I've seen it in a couple of other places. There's a lynching that takes place in 1913, black man is murdered, the NAACP sends a letter to the governor, what are you going to do about this, about this terrible, horrific mis miscarriage of justice? Governor responds, if I had been in town, I would have attended the lynching myself. Here's the question that I ask my classes, in order for us to understand what state sanctioned violence look like, looks like, it's 1955. You just tried to register to vote. Who do you call when the people shooting into your house at 1 o'clock in the morning are members of the deputy, are, are deputy sheriffs? Who do you call when the people burning down your barn because you tried to register to vote are members of the fire department? Who do you call when you write a letter to the governor 
asking him to enforce the constitution of the state and of the United States of America. And the governor says, if I had been in town, I would have attended the lynching myself. This is the violence. This particular type of violence is the violence that Martin King was trying to reveal to us. It's the violence that led him to Birmingham. It's the violence that led him to Selma. It's the violence that led him to Memphis, Tennessee in March and April of 1968, my fair city. Right, that violence. We don't understand, and I know this is an aside, and I'll shut up in a minute, or, or not, but um, we, don't, we haven't done a good enough job of really helping people understand what this country was like just 50 years ago. Right? Now, part of, that is, part of that is a whole bunch of folks don't want to hear what the country was like 50 years ago. Right? Let's be clear about that. Right? Again, back to this master narrative of the, of the movement. Hey, the movement's over. Right? High five. We fixed it. So anything after that, well, why are you, why are you talking about that? Why are you always bringing that up? Why are you always bringing that up? Right? We don't get it, and that's part of our, that's part of our challenge. That's part of our challenge. I bumped into a story about Sidney Poitier filming uh, in the heat of the night. The film, he refused to go uh, into the South because it's 1967, right? He refused to go into the South, so they, they, filmed the, they made the film in, New Orleans, um, in, in, in Illinois. So they found a, a town in Illinois, and they called that town Sparta. But at the end of the, at the, end of the shoot, they needed some scenes in front of at right, a southern courthouse. They needed some scenes in, in front of a, of, of a plant, of plantation-style homes. They needed to go south, right? So Sidney tells the director of, um, of, of the movie, Norman Jewison, he says, um, I'll give you four days. We will go for four days. And then he says, then the Jewison goes on to say, Sidney told me, he was only going to give us four days. So we all went down to the small town and with one hotel, and it was whites only. So all of us, the cast and crew, ended up in a Holiday Inn a little ways away. They're down in Mississippi, which allowed both blacks and whites. And I'll never forget, these pickup trucks came into the parking lot in the middle of the night, honking their horns and waking people up. I got a little nervous, so I called my crew and told them, get the biggest guys on the grip department and electrical department and get them over to Sydney's room right now. We, we need to protect him. Then I called Sydney's room. And I said, uh, don't worry, Sydney, we will take care of any, everything. And Sydney said, I'm not worried. I've got a gun under my pillow. So the first one of them that comes to the door, I'm going to blow them away. Thank God nothing happened. But this naive director from Canada suddenly understood the extent of American racism. I began to really get just how vicious things were. In 1966, Sydney Portier is the most famous movie star in the United States. And he has the reasonable expectation that if he spends too much time in the state of Mississippi, he may be murdered. If the most famous black person in the country, and arguably one of the most famous black people in the world, is nervous about the fact that if they spend four days in the state, they might be murdered, what do you think life is like for the black people who live in Mississippi? in 1966, or Tennessee, or Florida, or Los Angeles, or Chicago, or Poughkeepsie, New York. We gotta do better about that. So, all right, in conclusion, we face a number of other challenges that sadly, King would find all too familiar. He would recognize churches dotting the nation that were, more, were nothing more than, as he called them, irrelevant social clubs without moral or spiritual authority. I love that quote. He would recognize that the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism have yet to be conquered. He would recognize the racially inscribed pockets of poverty found from coast to coast. In the wake of the gutting of the Voting Rights Act by the Supreme Court, King would view with weary recognition the systematic efforts of state legislatures to disenfranchise minority voters again. He would recognize the fierce urgency of Black Lives Matter and would be all too familiar with the seemingly ceaseless problem of police brutality. And he would most certainly recognize the cultivated and curated wave of violence visited upon the Capitol a year ago. In numerous respects, justice has not rolled down like waters upon many of the people in our nation. 
who live in a society still buffeted by pervasive racial divisions. But King would also recognize and appreciate the value in our attempts to make sense of our past, especially the effort to grapple with its complexity and possibility. When we assess King in his fullness and stop killing his memory and his legacy, he provides us an opportunity to reinvigorate our understanding both of the man and the movement he joined. For so many of us, there are myriad rewards for guiding each other into an enhanced exploration of King's words and actions. When we render Brother Martin fully human, when we place him back in his time, when we open ourselves to the possibility of achieving significant insights into history, language, politics, we can do the thing that King called us to do, which is to engage in the beautiful struggle to make a new world. Thank you. So we'll, do be, we'll be doing questions now. If anybody has a question, just please raise your hand and I'll come to you with the mic. Thank you so much, Dr. McKinney. Um, thank you for the great talk. I just have a, a question about contextualizing your arguments in, in you know, 2022. It's, for example, in 2020, you saw a lot of digital activism, people signing petitions, people doing you know, retweeting tweets and thinking that was activism and, and all of that. So when you contextualize this idea of, you know, becoming a, a better society is what, what's the best tactic to fulfill those dreams in a digital world? The best tactic. That's going to start me off with the small questions, right? Yeah. I, I make your job easy. <laughs> so I think, you know, I think that folks in the black freedom struggle, I think folks all throughout the 60s, right, whether it's the early 60s, and we're talking about, you know, civil rights organizations, or the later 60s, early 70s, we're talking about black power, black, black power organizations, right? Um, they understand that, that moving society forward is always a multifaceted effort, right? Um, there are numerous factors, there are numerous variables uh, in the calculus of liberation. So, you know, one of the things we should be leery of is the idea that a, a, a particular tool or a particular device or a particular perspective is going to be that silver bullet with regard to how we move, how we move forward, right? Um, so what does that mean? It means that, you know, social media is a powerful tool and a powerful advocate and also a powerful enemy, right? Um, if you are predisposed to believe, to believe a particular set of things, you can go and find your community that believes the same thing you do. Right? One, of the, one of the big mistakes that, that, um, that advocates of, uh, that technological advocates made uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, as, as, the, as the internet is starting to be born, right, is they thought it was going to be a, 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 a space where it was going to be a digital commons where everybody could come together and you know, and, and read the same set of information, read the same sources, and move, and, and move together, right, as a society. And what happened was the exact opposite, right? Initial conceptions of, of social media was that, you know what, it's going to be, it's going to be like, it's going to be like the, you know, back in the day there were three networks, right? This is way before y'all's time. Um, you know, the old heads in here know back in the day, CBS, ABC, and NBC, right? There's three stations. After those stations are off, right, they play the Star Spangled Banner, it goes off for the night, right? You know, um, and so, so the digital commons in 1955, the digital commons in 1975, right, were those three stations. So we could all come together, and we might not agree on everything, but we are all getting our information, for instance, from Walter Cronkite. We're all getting our information from these three these three heavily curated places. So we can still have our disagreements, but we're having, well, we have a common, we have a common set of observations, sometimes even a common set of facts from which to disagree, right? Social media has blown up that idea, blown it to bits, right? So if I think the moon landing was faked in 1969, Two things can happen. I can go on the internet and say, oh, wow, okay, 
yeah, well, here's some evidence that NASA has presented that the moon landing was not, in fact, faked. I could also go online and find millions of people who agree with me, which will then deepen my resolve that the moon landing was faked. Right? So substitute moon landing for um, police brutality. Substitute moon landing for um, infant mortality rates. Rates in which uh, black folk have asbestos in their homes and um, non-black folks don't. Right? I mean, you know, so you see where I'm going with this, right? You know, so, so, you know, so, the, so, the, so the tool that on the one hand um, can be used to organize in some really powerful ways is also the same, the very same tool, right, that is, that is, that is being used to orient people against all of the things that you would want to organize for, right? So, you know, so, so social media is a tool. Um, we can't view it as the only tool. Right. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, and I would defer to my my dear friend Paul Ortiz about this. Right. At the end of the day, um, what you got to do. Got to knock on doors. Right. Um, organizing can take a variety of forms. That's one of them. Social media is one of them. Right. Hitting the doors, hitting the streets. And again, there's all manner of other things that need to happen. We need to be we need an eye on um, an eye on political choices. Right. An eye on you know, who's running for what, an eye on policy, policy choices and decisions, right? How are we organizing? How are we mobilizing, right? There's a totality of, there's a totality of things we have to be concerned about and we have to think, or think through, right, in terms of how do we move forward. This is the lesson of history. Marches alone didn't get us the Voting Rights Act. Marches alone didn't get us, an, an, you know, um, a, 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 uh, um, a, a breaking down of segregation. It was a totality of components. And what we have to do is figure out what those components are, activate those components, and that can help us move forward. We have a comment question online, and it says, Catherine says, he was so right, the new order of social decay and disintegration, we are there now. In my 85th year, I grieve for my country, but where do we go now, what can we do? Well, you know, um, King's last books, where do we go now? You know, where do we go from here? Chaos or community, right? Um, and I think what's, we're, we're really, where we really are now, right, is a whole bunch of us have to ask, what am I ready to fight for? Right? And what does that fight look like? Um, there's this book out, uh, I can't remember the name of the author, but he, um, he, he's got this phrase, the phrase is called political hobbyism. He says, for a critical mass of Americans, politics has become like a sport, like a hobby, right? I love the Raiders. I'm from California, right? So I love following, well, they're, they're in Las Vegas now. They broke my heart, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but I follow the Raiders, right? You know, um, I don't have any, you know, nothing I do will impact whether or not the Raiders win or lose. I'm a fan of the Raiders. That's it, right? I have a Raiders hat and I have a Raiders sweater. There's nothing that I do that will impact whether or not they win. A growing number of Americans are looking at politics right, as a sport. And the extent of their participation is social media, right? Likes and dislikes, right? Frowny faces and whatever, whatever, right? So we've got a critical, so we've got, so one of our problems is we've got a critical mass of Americans who are stepping away from, away from politics because it's so rancorous, because it's so contentious, so on and so forth. That's a huge challenge, right? So the so the question on the table is what's you know what's what's the gut check look like? Right? Ella Baker used to say, We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Sadly, that is still the case. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Freedom's never free, it always comes at a cost. The other reminder here is how tentative our democracy was to begin with. Right? People are like, well, it's 240 years old. No, not really. Not really. Not the democracy that I would want to live in. Right? I, I'm not trying to go back to 1787. Right? Any colored people in the room trying to go back to 1787? No. Right? Our democracy, right? Our fragile democracy, right? You know, you should actually start the clock on multiracial democracy in 1965. Right? That's two years before I was born. 
And that democracy is fragile. Right? So one of the things we've got to do is, is, is understand the fragility, the fragility of our democracy. Right? The fragility of the democracy for an increasing number of people. Right? So that's the other thing that we can do. And you know, 85-year-olds, I'm always reluctant to tell 85-year-olds what they should do. Right? But this is one of the things we need to do is we need to, we need to, we need to have a, a cold heart assessment of where we are as a nation. Right? And, what, and, and, uh, and have a cold heart assessment of what we're ready to fight for. Hand in the front here. I really must thank you very much. I'm not sure what that you intended to make me a very strong listener this emotional. This is my second time of standing in front of somebody who's thoroughly messed me up. I feel, I feel a man who gave his life has been betrayed. And you have put those betrayal in words that are beyond what I can express. Thank you very much. The first time I ever went to the plantation in Louisiana, I cried all night. It was so impossible to think that human beings were treated like that. And here I am again sitting down and listening to what one of the giants had to say. Every time I looked at those letters Bob Graham sent her, he keeps telling me what I'm hearing is how to make America become grounded citizens. If you look clearly, I heard what you said, and I'm saying what would it be like to kiss or kissing king's knowledge? How do we take the three legs of his message, the political, the economic, and the spiritual? America finds it very convenient to harp on the sound bites of a political. Kwame Nkrumah once said, seek ye the kingdom of, the political kingdom, mm -hmm. and all other things will be added unto you. Unto you. Americans, especially the blacks, have sought the political kingdom, and they have been denied all the dividends and the fruits or mostly of the economy. Poverty, you just need to experience it. So my question to you today is how is it possible to reinstate the trinity of the ideas encapsulated in the vision of King? I see the visual there, and I know that there are two kings, the king of a screen and the king of a street. The king of a screen is so harmless, easy to cuddle, but the, street, the king of a street is what calls to action that after each and every one of us lives here, we should do one thing. We should do something. If anybody lives here, you are a fantastic speaker. I could listen to you forever. But the thing is, that call to action, that each and every one of us present here today should go away and do one thing different from what we've ever done. I thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, brother. Thank you very much, and I hope that the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences will not be the same. Somebody can say amen. And the University of Florida will not be the same, and will remark your coming 
and challenging the scholars here and challenging the men and women and the students that King is not only about having a dream. It's not only about the content of our character, but it's much more than that. Thank you, brother. Thank you. That's, um, you've given me a lot to think about. Thank you so much for that comment. I really, I really appreciate it. Um, I got so many thoughts about what you've just said. And the first thing my mind did was it went to um, the Negro National Anthem, right? God of our weary years, God of our silent tears. Crying out when hope unborn had died, right? One of the things that I take consolation in in terms of being an historian is I can look at 2022 and I can say, man, you know what? We're in a tight spot right now. And a couple of things then kicks in, right? One is my training kicks in. And I'm like, yeah, but this is not 1922, right? This isn't 1822. This isn't 1722. What did we do in those moments, right? How did we organize? How did we mobilize? How did we move through? How did we move through those moments when we didn't have any hope of victory, right? What does it look like to mobilize against slavery in 1822, right? What does it look like to be an abolitionist, a black abolitionist in 1822? What does it look like to be owned by somebody else in 1822? What does freedom look like for you, right, if you are owned by somebody else? What does freedom look like for you if you live in Philadelphia in the 1820s, and your life is still defined by slavery, still defined by this un, you know, by this dubious, this, this tenuous status you have. You are neither, you're not a slave, but you're not a citizen either. What does freedom look like? What, is, what do freedom dreams look like in that, in that moment? And part of the answer to that question is something that King said in a, um, a, a sermon he gave in March of 1968. It's about three, three weeks before he dies. And it's a sermon called Unfulfilled Dreams. It is amazing. Go home tonight. Pull, up, pull it up on Google. Unfulfilled Dreams. It is a brilliant and powerful and devastating bookend to I Have a Dream. 1963. I have a dream that we're going to, you know, we're going to engage in all this work, but I have a dream that we get there. In 1968, he was like, what happens when you work and 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 you don't get where you want to go? And his text is an, is an Old Testament um, story about... Um, Somebody trying to build a temple. I think Solomon's trying to build a temple in honor of his father. And, he, and he, he doesn't do it. He fails at it. Right? And the kicker of the line is, you know, um, it's okay that you didn't do it. I know you were true to thine heart. Right? You imbued, you imbued the thing that you wanted to do. Another way of saying that is that you had freedom dreams and you went out and tried to achieve those freedom dreams. That's not adequate, right? That's not an adequate answer to this question. But it's the only answer I have, is that we have to do, we have to do more. Um, we have to do better. And we have to be upfront and clear about what that actually means. I am a big fan of community service. I think community service has its place. Um, but a day of service for Martin Luther King Martin King's like, uh, yeah, great, paint a house. Um, but does your district attorney disproportionately send black people to prison? How about for the day of service, you work on getting a new district attorney? Right? That's the thing, right? We're all sort of stuck in the matrix, old movie, movie reference, right? We're all stuck in, this, in, in, this, in that King 2.0 version, right? It's, 
to, you know, you know what, I, I feel motivated and, and, and I want to go and do something about where we are, so I'm going to go post on Facebook. I'm going to go put something on Twitter. I'm going to go paint a house. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go um, into this book club and we're going to read some provocative work. That's not the work, right? You know, a couple of years ago, I stopped telling people who came up to me, you know, Dr. McKinney, this is so, we're going we're gonna to start a book club. Great. And then what? Right? And then what? Churches, you, you, and you talked about the three points, right? So that, you know, one of the one, religious institutions, right? King says, look, you know, we don't, we need, we have too many irrelevant social clubs. And that's not just white churches. Let's be clear about that. There's a whole bunch of churches packed with people who look like me who don't want anything to do with trying to transform the status quo. Let's be clear about that, right? Prosperity gospel is a, is a cancer that has metastasized on American Christianity. It's eating it from the inside. It is eating, it, it is eating Christianity from the inside. Um, Christianity... Still, after 2,000 plus years grappling with the transition from being a religion of the oppressed to being the religion of the state. That's a 2,000 year old struggle that the church has. King was figuring that out. And you know how he was able to figure that out? Because of his black mama and his black daddy who raised him in a black church. And when he went to Morehouse, he learned from he learned from Walter Shivers and sociology and, 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 and Wendell Reed and religion. And Wendell Reed told him, look, King, no, uh, Richard Kelsey told him, look, King, the religion of, of a bunch of our parents, that religion is not going to, it's not going to, it's not going to kill segregation. That religion, the, the, the practice of that religion, that's going to accommodate segregation. That's, we will all be segregated, but we're all, but we all love Jesus. That's not going to smash segregation. We need a new version. We need a new iteration. Some would say we need an old iteration of our religion. An iteration of the religion that says, you know what? Slavery is a moral sin. Slavery is a moral abomination. That's what the slaves thought. Right? Read Sterling Stuckey. Read cultural historians. They were like, um, you know, black Christians were like, um, my owner and me, one of us is going to hell. And it ain't me. Because if you own other people, no, <laughs> you're going to hell. Right? So part of the challenge, right, is that, and this is part of the thing that has been obscured. We've seen religion, Christianity in particular, that speaks truth to power. We've seen that happen before. We don't see it a lot now. Because religious institutions are so beholden to their, various, their varied political interests. One of the things I'm always pointing out to people, it's like, well, you know, I'm, I was like, look, you know, you associate black people with Democrats. <coughs> Excuse me. You associate black people with Democrats. Great. King is constantly mm, to the Democrats. Constantly. As a moral leader. Y'all aren't getting it right. Do better. Vietnam. Stop it. Militarism. It needs to end. Poverty. Do better. Racism. Do better. Democrats. King doesn't care who's in the White House. We need more moral leadership like that. Right? Um, you know, the the um, Poor People's Campaign that is currently you know, up and running. That's a brilliant example of this, right? Poverty truly is a moral issue. It's truly immoral for us to not have done better with regard to poverty, right? So we have the blueprints, we have the pieces, we just need the bodies. We need more people to step up and step out and say, you know what, In my, from my comfortable position, from my spot, this, this, I, 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 we can do, I can do better. Right. If I'm in Black Lives Matter and I'm, I'm down for Black Lives Matter, then, um, yeah, why, why, aren't, why, aren't, why aren't I paying attention to the to the to the D.A. race? How come I'm not actively involved in it? That's what if you think Black Lives Matter. 
right? I don't need your I don't need your hashtag activism. Damn that! I don't need you to wear a T-shirt. I need you to be organizing against your DA if you have a racist DA that's trying to incarcerate Ill- illegally and racistly incarcerate black people. That's how you fix that problem, right? Do the work. We can't get around the work. And when we think other people are going to do that work for us, that's where we're falling down. That's 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 how that's also how we lose. Right. So, yes, go do something. Talk to your friends and figure out what that something is. Some water down here. Yes. Perfect. Talk to your friends about what that something is. Talk to how you can move, how you can move collectively. The four freshmen, North Carolina A&T, sit in, starting off, the, kicked off the sit-ins, February 1, 1960, freshmen, first year college students. Oh, but my grades. Oh, but, but da, 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 da. whatever. Stop it. It's bigger than that. Right? It's bigger than that. And if you don't want to be out on the front lines, write a check. Write a check. Find the organization that you support. Find the organization that's doing some good work. Write a check. Have it come out of your bank account, regular basis. You got something in there. Give some of it. Give some of it to the movement. It's time for more of us to have skin in the game for this democracy that we say we want. It's time for more of us to have skin in the game to repair right, um, uh, the, the, the wounds of racial inequality in this country. It's time for us to have more skin in the game. Right? Do you know why we have to have offices of multicultural this and that and DEI and diversity and equity and and, and inclusion, you know why we have to have those things? Because we spent 200 years excluding people from our institutions. That's an economic, political, cultural, social, psychological phenomenon. It operates on all of those levels. That's hard work. Because the work isn't over when just when, when black people show up, right? Yay, we have a black. Here are black, there are black everywhere, a black, black, right? No, that's not how that works. That's the beginning of the battle. That's the beginning of the battle. It's not enough. So we all can do more. Thank you again for your comments. I really appreciate it. Thanks for sharing those words. Um, I guess my comment is, I remember Rosa Parks died a few years ago in the rotunda. Then you know they have politicians come through, how they support Rosa Parks, straight lying, you know, because they support voter suppression. But <laughs> the issue is like three Ps, protest, politics, and policy. How do we get people to understand, you know, now Dick Cheney's a hero now, right? Stop it, stop it. How do we get people to understand it's about policy, not personality? So on the spectrum, whether you're Dick Cheney or Marjorie Taylor Greene, you don't support clean water, public education, roads, transportation. Keep it on a policy level and not personality getting tricked like Dick Cheney, Liz Cheney. She's a good person now, but she supports the, the war empire. No public education, no infrastructure. How do we shift using King's words that is policies, understanding voting rights, understanding systems, and move away from personalities or CNN or you'll see on Monday, uh, Graham loves Dr. King, straight line. And people start clapping, well, he's not as bad as Marjorie Taylor Greene and all this, this uh, difference by degree. But ultimately, what are the policies of a particular party? What do they mean? How do we explain that to folks? And that's the method I've been trying to use, a bread and butter policy. Right. These right. are the issues. This is what they are. Either you're, either you're pregnant or you're not. And I think that's our democracy, either you're this or you're this. the middle ground is dying, <laughs> right? Not the kind of pregnant. <laughs> I'm a little bit pregnant. Um, thank you, Brother Canton. So two things come to mind. I'm thinking about William Clay and a bunch of other folks who said, look, no permanent friends, just permanent interests, right? So there will, there will come a time that, you know, the political figures that you, you know, love so dearly will be on the wrong side of an issue. Right. Um, that's the way politics works, particularly now that so much of it. I mean, so much. I mean, all of it almost is driven by so much by money. Right. Um, so. 
I think the, I, I think the, the focus on personalities, right, is a symptom of our inability to do that other thing you were talking about, right? An inability, in many instances, an inability to, to focus on particular types of policies, right? But it's complicated, right? Because, you know, because famous, you know, because famous people, right, whether you agree with them or not, right, can bring a lot of energy and a lot of, a lot of heat and a lot of light to particular types of issues, Right. So, you know, you might not be, you know, so you might think that AOC is, for instance, is, you know, oh, she just needs to be she's just a backbencher and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, fine. But, you know, before she came along, I bet you didn't know. I bet you'd never heard of the Green New Deal. Right. So, you know, so the pop, so so the personalities can play a role. The thing that's missing in all of this, I would say, right, is the movement. Right. Mass mobilizations make politicians listen. Right. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of folks who weren't all that pressed about voting for the civil rights bill in 1964, but they were getting letters from constituents. Right. I'll never forget reading a, a, an account of this representative from Iowa who, you know, he's got like three black people in his district. He didn't care about this. He's like, this, that's a southern problem. Da, 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 da. But slowly but surely, he starts getting letters from constituents. You know, 62 letters from constituents, 63 letters from constituents. 1964 starts off, and the number one issue that his lily white district is asking him about is, whether, is how he's going to vote on the civil rights bill. And so he's like, oh, well, okay, well then. Um, you know, Ma and Pa Kettle are asking me whether or not I'm voting for the civil rights bill. Now it's on my radar, right? That's just good old-fashioned politics. If I don't vote the right way, they're going to put me out of office. That's movement work. That's one of the things you can do here locally, right? City council races are won by three digits, four digits, right? State house, state senate races, so four digits, five digits sometimes, right? That's where, that's where the movement work comes in, right? Movements shift the center of gravity. Right? Movements for things you support, movements for things you don't support. Movements shift the center of gravity. Right? And as we've seen recently, these movements don't have to be, you know, you don't, you don't, we're not talking about millions of people. Right? It did not take millions of people to get critical race theory on the ballot in states all across the country. Anti-CRT people did not have a march on Washington. There wasn't 250,000 of them uh, congregated somewhere and then they all went home and were like ah anti-CRT I have no idea what it is but we should stop it right it didn't take a million people to do that that's an object lesson that's an object lesson right so again it gets back to it gets back to the mobilization for me at least right the biggest part of my answer is it gets back to the mobilization. It gets back to how do we, how do we place p politicians in a position where if they don't vote our interests, then they know that their political lives are in jeopardy. And a lot of times what that's going to mean for, for a whole bunch of us, right, in Memphis, what that's going to have to start meaning for a whole bunch of us is we're going to have to start voting against, we're going to start voting against our friends. We're going to start voting against folks who may have been allies in other, in other areas. Have started voting against people who actually might even look like me. Right? Brother, you know, you've been really great on these issues, but you don't have a mumbling word to say about whether or not we need to replace our, um, our awful DA. We have one of the worst DAs in the country in, in, um, in, in Memphis, Tennessee. This book, Charged, came out talking about really good DAs and really bad DAs. Ours was one of the bad ones. Right? <laughs> she's, she's terrible. I need you to, I need you to, I need you to, where are you on that? Right? Because where you are on that determines whether or not you get this $500 check. And whether or not you get $500 checks from the 50 people I'm getting ready to email with your answer. We need more of us start doing that. Right? So then when homeboy is like, oh, well, <laughs> well, you know, maybe I need to, you know, again, folks got, politics is about power. And pressure, you know the drill, right? Frederick Fred told y'all, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Politics is the same way. 
A. Philip Randolph goes in to meet with Frederick, um, Frederick, with um, Franklin Roosevelt about, you know, um, segregated, uh, you know, the segregated defense industry. He says, look, we're getting ready to, you know, and so they have this back and forth. And um, Roosevelt, I want you to pass, you know, Fair Employment Practices Commission. I want you to pass, you know, fair employment legislation. Roosevelt famously says to him, I, I, you have to make me do this. I can't go into Congress and be like, hey, y'all, I need the FEPC. You need to pressure me. I need pressure to do it. Randolph was like, message received. I'm going to go out and create the March on Washington movement. We're going to have branches all across the country. And on a certain day in 1941, we're going to bring a quarter million black people to a protest in the, middle, in, the, in the midst of war. We're going to bring a whole bunch of people in this protest, protesting the fact that the arsenal of democracy is a, is a, is a bastion of racism. There's the pressure. So then he gets to go to Congress and say, hey, hey, look, you know what? I'm going to have to do this executive order. It's out of my hands. It's above me now. It's above me now, right? I got to go do this thing because, you know what? Our, the base of our constituency, the base of our party outside of the South is getting ready, to, you know, getting ready to revolt. So I have to do this. I have been pressured to do the right thing. Are we pressuring enough people to do the right thing? This gets back to personalities. Expecting personalities to do the right thing, stop that. Stop it. Make those personalities do the right thing. Politics is all about pressure. We have another question from online that says, how can we expect change to occur or even facilitate change in federal or societal systems when there are still those in the judiciary that subscribe to the Dr. King 2.0? Oof, that's another great question. Um, I've got a dear friend who is um, a constitutional lawyer, uh, Ron Sullivan. And um, one of the things he says, and I think, he, I think he's right, right, is we have to be prepared. We have to be prepared to play the long game. Right. One of the downsides, one of the challenges of living in a, you know, in, 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 a, in a social media culture is an expectation of things happening instantaneously, right? If enough of us march in the summer of 2020, we're going to fix racism in America. And it sure might, it might have seemed like that, right? Because, you know, a whole bunch of people are making a whole bunch of noises about all the things that they're going to do, right? Corporations, we're not going to fund the people who you know, who supported the insurrection. We're going to pump billions of dollars into black organizations and blah, 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 blah. The corporations are right back to supporting the insurrectionists who are in Congress. And, right, and all of those billions of dollars that they promised to black organizations, we have not arrived there. We haven't gotten there yet, right? So this is about the long game. And that's the thing we have to be prepared for is what does it look like to think not about, right, not about the next election, not about 2024, right, but 2034, 2044, 2054, right? How do we think about what we want this place to look long after we're gone? A daunting thought. A dear friend of mine said what, we, what that means is we have to exhibit something called revolutionary patience. We are in the process of fighting for the new world and hoping and, 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 and carrying, if you're a religious person, carrying a prayerful hope of this, of, of this new world, right? This sense of faith, as Cornel West says, step out on nothing and land on something, right? This sense of faith, but also with an understanding that I might not actually see any of the changes that I am battling for. I might not actually see them. Again, back to 1822, black folk alive in 1822, the vast majority of them did not see freedom. Shoot, let's go back to 1722. None of them saw freedom. None of them. Legal, legislative freedom. Many folks went out and claimed their own freedom. Right? But the abolition of slavery? No. I didn't see that in 1722. Some people saw it in the 1780s in the North. Right? But we're not going to get to 1865. 
How do, you, how do you fight for something that you don't, see the, you don't see the end of? You don't see the horizon of slavery. How do you still fight for it? You don't see the horizon on the thing that you're trying to fix. You don't see the horizon. The, the, you know, the, the court is structured in a certain way. The federal courts are structured in a certain way, right? The judiciary is, uh, you know, from my perspective, the judiciary is stacked against me. Okay, yeah. And? And? Right, the judiciary was stacked against black people in 1896, Plessy v. Ferguson. Black voting rights, black, uh, black registered voters in Louisiana after the voter suppression, voter exclusion laws that got passed. Black voters in Louisiana went from 250,000 in, in, um, uh, in the 1880s, 250,000, 1890s, 5,000. Purged 245,000 black people from the rolls. You think you got it bad. Right? So again, we have models for this. Right? How do we move forward when our rights are being eroded? Not even eroded, but taken away from us. Right? When the vote is being con contracted. When we are literally being excluded from the right to vote in several states. How do we move forward in that context? How do we move forward when we think the judiciary is stacked against us? And none of those answers are perfect, right? You're not gonna, we're not gonna necessarily going to thread a needle on this. That's the other thing about movement work. Movements are messy, right? One of the things my students like to talk about a lot is, well, you know, back in the day, you know, people were more organized back in the day. You know, we were just more unified. If there was more unity back in the day, I was like, stop. Stop. See, that makes my throat tickle. <clears throat> that's part of the work, figuring out how to move forward. What are we going to do? What does it look like? Where should it happen? That's part of the work, figuring that out. This isn't a math problem. This is not arithmetic. Building that boat as we go along. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, talk and remarks tonight, Dr. McKinney. Please give him a round of applause. And join me. I want to point out that uh, in addition to all of you folks here, remotely we had over 60 folks attending uh, the talk as well throughout. So uh, obviously we had a, a wonderful audience tonight. And you've given us a lot to, to think about here. Uh, especially as we approach uh, the holiday, the celebration of, of Martin Luther King Jr., but much more importantly, I would argue, and much more broadly, as we approach every day moving forward, uh, as we think about what our own visions of democracy are here in the United States uh, and how we seek to pursue democracy here in the United States. So thank you again. It's been a pleasure to have you here, and thank you again to our co-sponsors here uh, as well. It's been a pleasure to work with you all. And this concludes the evening. Thanks.